has he got a teleology? Ha has he got a vision of what society should be like, other than what I as, uh, got from your speech, um, something like a pre-Socratic uh, society with about 5% nobility, maybe, and, and the rest are all slaves? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's sort of my question. Um, the other question is for Sean Gabb. Um, uh, about the Savile case, uh, I, I, lived in Eng I live in England as well, so I've got a close view of this. And I have a slight different um, view of this. Uh, could it be seen as a revolt ag uh, of the people against um, the trend to debauchery, which uh, I think is a kind of Gramscian tool to destroy the middle class? Um, and finally, it, it got too much, uh, as seen by the Savile case, and there has been a kind of uprising against it. Um, is, can you see this as part of the, this phenomenon? Thank you. I think Nietzsche, Nietzsche is imaginating a kind of elite. Yeah, close the microphone. Nietzsche is uh, imaginating a kind of, kind of elite uh, in a very maybe a very ancient, maybe a very barbaric way, you know? So, so, so he, he, he didn't wrote that, that directly, but, but, but I think this, this, this Dionysian world is, is a world uh, uh, of maybe a few barbaric leaders mm -hmm. surrounded with poets and musicians and, yeah, and, and, and they live a, a very uh, vital and, and Maybe funny and, and cruel life, yeah? and they're surrounded with uh, a people. They adore them, and they uh, adore them because because they give them sense. Mm -hmm. These people, yeah? and 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 the um, uh, the thing they got back yeah? is 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 food, food and and help. Yeah? It's a very Ancient and and, and rural uh, society. It's, it's it's something something that doesn't exist anymore, and I think will will never exist. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yes, Robert. Uh, thank you for your question, and I'll, I'll begin by saying that. Um, when you are dealing with a mass phenomenon like the Savile hysteria, there may well be no single cause, and part of the hysteria may well have been um, a, a reaction against the perceived debauchery of British life by trashy entertainers like the late Jimmy Savile. Um, another way of looking at it, however, is to see post-war British life as a progression uh, but, but a progression in which one part passes into another. Now, now, in the 1960s and 70s, we had what is called the permissive society, everything goes. Some of you may have seen those awful um, carry-on comedy films in, in which middle-aged men run around uh, ch chasing young semi-clad ladies, or, or perhaps the Benny Hill show, which was rather higher class. But um, during the past 20 years, there has been a sharp reverse of permissiveness. And we are now living in a much more puritanical society in which people are expected to conform to all sorts of new standards. Indeed, we're often told that modern England has a much more tolerant uh, approach to homosexuality. And in a sense it does, because whereas homosexuality used to be illegal, it, it, it may now be regarded for some purposes as compulsory. But, um, <laughs> but sorry, I borrowed that from Bob Pope. Um, <clears throat> forgive me. Um, something that needs to be borne in mind is that if Oscar Wilde were to commit today in England, the offences for which he was sentenced to three years hard labour in 1895, he would get a much longer prison sentence 
because many of the uh, rent boys with whom he was consorting were considerably under the age of consent. Uh, and so in that sense, many of our um, sexual standards and the laws underpinning those standards are harsher today than they were in the past. And uh, this is a fairly recent development. So, so yes, what happened in the Jimmy Savile case may have been a reaction against the permissiveness of the 1960s and 70s, or it may be an example of a reaction which had already taken place against that permissiveness. It, it is difficult to say because, as I said, we're talking about something done and believed by very large numbers of people, all of whom may well have had slightly different motivations. Yes, of course. I, I, I just mentioned something that I was told, uh, it's an anecdote, and of course I believe everything I'm told, but this chap uh, had worked for a very long time for the BBC back in the 1950s and 60s. And he said that the reason Jimmy Savile was uh, employed in the first place uh, was that he was vulgar and uh, was perceived to be uh, working class. And at that time, the BBC was run by upper middle class uh, people who had lost their belief that they had a right to, um, uh, to set the standard for society. So they looked around for someone whose behavior was horrible, and they found uh, Savile, and uh, they employed him. Um, and the demand for people like Savile actually didn't come from below in the first place. It was, uh, there were no people uh, marching through the streets saying, give us more vulgarity on TV, we want more vulgarity. Uh, it was a decision by, uh, by the BBC elite. I have a question to Sean Gap. You mentioned that England uh, is ruled by American Marxists, but I wonder um, what happened to the Fabians and how was it possible that this, uh, this movement was, uh, as far as I know, um, created in England? Mm -hmm. Very well. Um, again, I'll say that we are dealing with, an, with a progress through time. The Fabian socialists were the, the, the Fabian socialists were not Gramscian Marxists. The, the Fabian socialists believed in uh, authoritarian state socialism, w which is rather different from the authoritarianism of the people who rule modern Britain. Uh, the people who rule modern Britain, and I'm now talking about Britain rather than England, the, the people who rule modern Britain are not terribly interested in who runs the railways or the telephone network or, or indeed whether the universities are formally private or are ro royal corporations. What interests them is that whatever the system, they should be in control and that they should impose their moral and cultural standards um, irremovably uh, upon the whole population. Uh, and so, yes, there, there is a native British tradition of socialism, but it is a different tradition from the one which has taken hold in modern Britain. Um, I, 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 call them, I didn't call them American Marxists. What I'm saying, and I'm not entirely original in this, I owe this observation to a mutual friend with Robert called Ian B. The initial inspiration came from European Marxists and neo-Marxists. Uh, as I said, Antonio Gramsci, Louis Althusser, uh, Theodore Adorno, um, uh, a group of people who were developing Marxist thought for the changed conditions of the 20th century. But it, it is quite possible that these people would have remained obscure foreign thinkers completely unknown in England except among a, a rather eccentric elite. But for the fact that many of these people, Herbert Marcuse for example, and, and even Michel Foucault, moved to the United States and became very influential w within American universities. 
And it is from America that these European Marxists and neo-Marxists were able to, to gain a decisive influence over um, English life. That is how it came in. But, but again, we are dealing with um, intellectual developments and actions among very large numbers of people and there is always more than one way of looking at it, and there is certainly always more than one cause. But um, I, I suggest that the scheme I've just outlined is at least a useful way of trying to explain what has happened and what is happening. Not, not just in England, of course, but also in your countries, because we are all nowadays cultural satellites in the United States. And that is why... Um, developments in the, within the American universities have been so important in England and in other countries. But as I said, the United States has a certain limited immunity uh, against these um, intellectual infections so far as they have a strong native religious right and an entrenched constitutional order which, will t which is still taking a long time to subvert completely whereas countries like England have no religious right and no entrenched constitutional system. And so uh, what has given America a cold has given us um, terminal pneumonia. Uh, I would like to thank all four speakers for great speeches. Uh, my question goes to Sean Gap again. Uh, I would like to point out the role of British humor, being a fan and great admirer of British humor. What happened to the role of British humor against the authority? And uh, lastly, if you have any promi prominent comedians that you would like to recommend us to follow from the British comedy. Yes, the British, and you did ask me this question earlier, so I've had time to think about it. So if I sound rather polished, it's, uh, it's not spontaneous. Um, British humour in the 1960s and 70s was anti-authoritarian in the conditional sense, not in the intrinsic sense. That is, these, these comedians did not regard authority or authoritarianism as bad in itself they regarded it as bad because it was the wrong kind of authoritarianism. And as soon as these people reached middle age, and I think David Frost might be a good example, um, as, as soon as these people reached middle age and they and their friends got into positions of importance in England, political satire died. It, it died suddenly in 1997. Right up until then, the television was filled with savage political satire and invective against the authorities. The moment their man, Tony Blair, was in Downing Street, political satire just vanished. It vanished from the screen like some disgraced Soviet tractor factory manager. Um, and humor has, British humor has been at rather a low level ever since then. There are anti-left humorists in England. I suppose someone called Jimmy Carr might count as one, and he just about gets by on television. Um, but for the most part, subversive, anti-authoritarian um, humor is in short supply in modern England because it doesn't get a an airing on the BBC. I mean, why do you need to subvert something which is by definition the best of possible worlds. That is what the average BBC bureaucrat would ask. Uh, just uh, let's take a vote. Uh, how many people in this room have heard uh, Mr. Cameron tell a joke or say anything funny? <laughs> Dr. Daniels, your presentation uh, reinforced my sense of optimism as to both how and why so much of human action is becoming decentralized. And it goes back to some of the understanding that's deriving from uh, the study of chaos. And chaos tells us that the more complex a system becomes, 
uh, the more impossible, and actually it becomes impossible to make predictions. And there's probably nothing more unpredictable, more nonlinear in terms of, of behavior than the individual human being. And it, I just wonder to what extent chaos theory itself is going to help make efforts to predict both harms and benefits from collective forms of medicine uh, a completely meaningless undertaking. Um, I regret to say that I'm completely unqualified to uh, answer this question because I know nothing really about uh, about chaos theory. All I can say is that from my reading of the medical journals, experiments have continued to be done on huge numbers of people and there is a fundamental rule I would have thought that if you need vast numbers of people to show, to establish benefit, then the benefit can't itself be all that great. And um, and that seems a thought that doesn't occur to people who do experiments on vast numbers of people. So, but I'm, I'm afraid the specific thing about chaos theory, I'm not a, in a position to answer. Um, so my, my question is uh, to Eugen on, on Nietzsche. You know, Nietzsche claimed to be an apolitical uh, thinker and he didn't say much what he was for in, in, in politics, uh, but he said uh, quite a lot what he was against. And he was, he was clearly uh, against uh, uh, socialism, against uh, democracy, against equalitarianism, against the state. And, uh, you know, when, when the, uh, the Danish critic uh, Georg Brandes that discovered uh, with, uh, both Nietzsche and, and Kierkegaard, in a letter, he, he labeled uh, Nietzsche a aristocratic radical. And Nietzsche quite liked that uh, term. He quite liked that uh, label. And perhaps that, that says something uh, about him. And I was, I was wondering, you know, I agree that uh, Nietzsche is, is certainly not uh, a Rothbardian. Uh, he's not an, an anarcho-capitalist. You know, he, he lacks the, the ethical structure of anarcho-capitalism. But wouldn't you say that it's fair to say that he is an, a, a right-wing uh, anarchist uh, of some type? Thanks. Maybe, maybe you could, you could, you could uh, say that the Greek polis, the antique Greek polis, is a kind of right-wing anarchy. If you, if you think so, that this is, this is the right term for that, then it fits. This, this was a world uh, uh, without uh, uh, rulers, uh, uh, a world dominated by families. Uh, they have their slaves, which, which was in, in former times a kind of employment. Uh, um, it was, it was not, not, not that slavery that, that, that you uh, uh, can see in, in Films or that, that what, what, what what people do with the black black people that's another thing. Yeah? Uh, well, people people that live around uh, these families and they, they have no no land that they have no 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 things to, to work with. And they they went to, to these people and uh, that was the, um, and, and this was the, these were the slaves who were living uh, in the houses and the other ones are uh, uh, working in the mines. That, that was a bad thing, but but this not it was a kind of employment, and and uh, yes. Maybe we should never forget that the Greek polis was based on slavery, and uh, this is one of the reasons why the philosophers they said philosophy that's a high thing, and the phylakes, the the warriors, that's a good thing. And people work, that's dirty, that's, that's not interesting, that goes on money and such things. We are above that, we are in politics, and that's much better than economy. And we still have kind of this uh, approach in, in, in some uh, uh, universities in, in, in Europe that, that, that we look down uh, to, to the economy 
uh, from the standpoint of politics that's much higher than and this is, uh, I think, uh, a bad heritage of, of uh, the ancient Greek time. Thanks. Question for uh, Anthony Daniels. Um, if the thrust of what you were saying was to allow patients to make decisions, including parents, in relation to their children, um, you, you spoke about the amount of misinformation that is out there. Uh, about treatments and the impact of treatments and so on. How do you get past this issue that, that individuals are making decisions in relation to a subject where they have no direct information, they are dependent upon information sources, which may all be wrong, particularly in an internet age. You can Google up any disease and you can read all sorts of stuff, which no doubt is all wrong. Um, so we'd be all in favor of, of, of free decision making by individuals, but if the free decision making is all based on stuff which is 99% rubbish, how, how do you think about dealing with that? Um, I think that uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, when people begin to uh, treat, uh, make decisions on behalf of children, which are obviously from a more rational standpoint, completely irrational and very harmful, um, uh, then it is a question of how you, how, how you deal with that and whether, um, uh, whether at some point there has to be an authority say, saying that you will not treat your child in that way and how that authority will actually uh, be arranged. Now, where the dividing line is, is of course always a very difficult question because there is a slope, a slippery slope to be uh, gone down. And for example, Richard Dawkins in his book, um, The God Delusion, suggests that bringing up any child in any form of religious belief is a form of child abuse. Now, either he's using the, the words metaphorically, in which case it's, it's a dangerous use of metaphor, or he means it literally, in which case, presumably, he means that there must be some public authority preventing um, uh, uh, people from um, bringing up children religiously. Now, where you draw the line, or whether the line has to be drawn at all, is, uh, is a very difficult question, and I think it's a matter of judgment rather and common sense rather than um, having a, 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 a an answer that will answer an answer that uh, is suitable to all cases. Should we perhaps uh, should there be laws against female circumcision? Um, I, I suppose most people would regard it as a as at least an abhorrent practice. But I suppose if we have laws against female circumcision we should also have laws against male circumcision. Um, and yes, I agree with Anthony. It's extremely difficult to draw the line. Um, as, a, as a rule of thumb, I would say, yes, if, uh, if parents circumcise their daughters, they should be sent to prison. If they circumcise their son, you just shrug and look the other way. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't like to say more. I have a question for Mr. Gabo, Dr. Daniel, sir. You spoke of this idea of tolerance in the, in the British society. Um, I'm thinking of the causes, perhaps, that have, have brought about these conditions you described. And I, um, well, one could not think of tolerance and not think that other nations are equally as tolerant, even if more so. So as an example, the Netherlands or Scandinavia, Denmark, even Germany or Switzerland, Austria. <clears throat> Yet the tolerance that we see in continental Europe has not really come down to this degradation of moral relativism that we see in the UK. And I, I bring in some of the writings of Dr. Daniels which describe it even in far starker terms than than we have heard today. Um, 
and I wonder as why that is the case. Uh, if you can uh, compound it, I think in the UK, uh, the only thing I can think of, frankly, is this. Uh, at the same time as this idea of tolerance has come about, there's been increasing intolerance towards, for example, God or religion or the church. This has not been seen in continental, continental Europe. Uh, and I wonder if there's a connection between the two. There, there's this idea of moral relativism has grown disproportionately than other places in the world. Do you want well, I'll give a particular answer. I'm sure you'll give one as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. I, I must say that uh, what has happened in modern England, to some extent, <laughs> forgive me, what has happened in modern England, to some extent, puts a question mark over the whole earlier history of England, which I still regard uh, as a time of unalloyed glory. Um, traditionally, or at least since the middle of the 17th century, England was a remarkably tolerant country for, for all manner of reasons, but one of the main reasons was that the tone of society was set by a landed hereditary aristocracy which did not feel threatened by any particular set of religious or political or cultural views. Uh, and so, because they didn't feel threatened by anything, they tolerated everything. Well, why? Um, even, the, e e even the panic of the 1790s against French Jacobinism was relatively mild in England compared with many other parts of the world which were threatened by French radicalism. Um, and, and with the decline of aristocratic values, which continued to dominate English culture for several generations after the decline of the actual aristocracy. With the decline of aristocratic values, you see the debasement of toleration from what we would mean by toleration into some kind of celebration of diversity, so, so long as the diverse people are of different, um, are, are of different colors, different races, different religions, um, different heights, different body sizes, different sexual preferences, but so long as they all believe in the same silly left-wing views. Um, and so that is the main difference between toleration in the traditional sense and, and toleration in the modern sense that makes your eyes turn up. One possible explanation, I wouldn't claim that it has any uh, scientific validity, is that uh, for a considerable length of time before um, present developments, we had a culture which valued and perhaps overvalued self-control and restraint. And when you get a moral gestalt switch, as it were, then you go to the opposite extreme, so that people think that what was formerly uh, regarded as a virtue is now a vice, and what is a vice is now a virtue. So um, people now uh, think, for example, young people, they, I've talked to quite a lot, they think that getting absolutely drunk in public is, is actually virtuous. It's good for them, and it's good because it is expressing themselves, irrespective of the fact that they have nothing to express, of course. <laughs> Um, and actually, if you listen to uh, young British people on the train, and I do, and I enjoy it, and they're talking about the wonderful night they had last night, um, uh, the main evidence of this is that they can't remember anything about it. <laughs> Which is a kind of rather dismal view of the possible, you know, of the pleasure of the view of their ple possible pleasures from social intercourse is the best that you can hope for is that you can't remember anything. Um, um, so I think that, and of course the traditional values did come under the kind of satirical attack that uh, Short has described and people therefore concluded that the opposite of uh, those uh, one-time virtues uh, were now virtues. 
So people, we have in Britain, I think for the first time, something which I wouldn't have believed possible, ideological drunkenness. People believe that they should get as drunk as possible. They believe it's a good thing to do it. It's not a lapse or anything like that. They aim at it. Of course, I agree that there is a link between aristocracy and culture and civilization. But uh, according to my Swiss approach, I think there is also a link between aristocracy and war. And uh, this is a price that we pay for this type of, of culture. And I have to remember that culture started with our, uh, agriculture. That's the starting point of, of every culture. And so it makes sense what I mentioned this morning, that, that the farmer is, uh, is higher than the king. Mm. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, you need uh, to, uh, if, if you have to separate culture from politics, that's a good thing. But uh, you should forget, you, you should never forget culture, and you should combine it with economy. And you should put culture and economy together uh, and, uh, and separate politics and culture. That's the most important thing we have to do. Yes, I suppose so. Um, sorry, I've, um, I've plagiarized Bob Hope. Let me plagiarize somebody else you may recognize. In England, we had aristocracy and we got the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, uh, and the rise of modern liberalism. In Switzerland, you had farmers, and you invented the cuckoo clock. Sorry, that's um, a completely gratuitous comment. But uh, I do think that aristocracy is a very important principle, and just because I don't happen to be a member of the aristocracy, does not in the least lessen my, my regret for the passing of aristocracy in England and indeed in every other European country. And I, I envy the Swiss, not for the cuckoo clock, but for their self-reliance, their independence, uh, and for their sense of privacy and their ability to maintain their civil liberties into an age when most other peoples have manifestly lost virtually all of their own civil liberties. Um, but I would admire Switzerland even more if it had a, an aristocracy. <laughs> Thank you. I stand corrected. <laughs> Okay, hi. Um, for Sean and, and Tony, feel free to jump in. Um, I'm a naturalized British citizen, and one of the things that always shocked me about being in England is that the immigrants, like me and my friends, seem to actually love it a lot more than the native British. Uh, not just because we couldn't remember everything from the night before, I, I hasten to add. Um, but do you, uh, do you uh, for either one of you, do you feel that if, and I know this is looking l like an increasingly unlikely possibility, but if the Scots left the Union, do you believe that maybe a lot of the left-wing gobbledygook would also leave with them and that England could go back to a more landed gentry aristocracy type of place? Because it seems to me there are a lot more right wing than the rest of the place? Um, or am I completely barking up the wrong tree? Um, let me have a good answer on that first. Um, what you're doing is you're inviting the pair of us to lapse into the kind of fault that many Americans fall into. Um, you ask a couple of Americans a question about particle physics and they'll start telling you what Thomas Jefferson said in 1786 or something. Um, if Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom, it would be much better for England, not because all of the really nasty socialists are Scottish, though a surprising number of them are, but because at the moment um, we'll, have a, we'll have a general election in two years' time. I shall vote Conservative in that election, not because I think David Cameron is doing a very good job, but simply because I do not want Labour back. And um, if Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom, that would be 65 Labour MPs 
who would not be sent to sit in the House of Commons, which means that we would not risk a Labour government again. And without the risk of a Labour government, without the threat of a Labour government, people like me do not have to vote Conservative. We can vote for something that we actually want, instead of voting against what we are terrified we might get. Uh, and, and that is that will be the benefit, I suggest, of breaking up the United Kingdom. It might actually be, it might actually be good for Scotland. Um, uh, to give a, another example, I, I had a ringside seat for the breakup of Czechoslovakia in the early 1990s. And many people said, oh, if the Slovaks go, pardon me, if the Slovaks go their own way, they'll be, uh, you know, they'll be putting up swastika flags within three years. Well, no. What happened was that um, left to their own devices, without the possibility of subsidies and guidance from Prague, the Slovaks pulled themselves together. And I, I won't call Slovakia an economic miracle in Central Europe, but it is a creditably prosperous, stable, semi-liberal democracy. And it might be the same for Scotland. Instead of voting for crazies in kilts, that they might start voting for people who will, um, who, who will pay some regard to the interests or at least the wishes of the taxpayers. Sorry. I don't have much to add. I think it probably would be a good thing for Scotland, actually. It would be a good dose of reality because the, the constant national dependence is, it, it doesn't breed gratitude, of course. It breeds resentment. And I read in The Spectator, and I don't know whether it's true, it, uh, I like to believe it's true, so it is true, that there are only 15,000 net taxpayers in Scotland. <laughs> and if that is the case, or anything approaching that is the case, then obviously uh, Scotland itself would have to change very profoundly, which it won't have to do so long as the union is maintained. However, people don't like to lose their subsidies, and I believe that, again, uh, more people are in favour of Scottish independence in England than in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so we might have a unilateral declaration of Scottish independence, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but not by the Scottish. <laughs> well, I, I have several friends who are thinking of moving to Scotland and registering themselves to vote so that they can vote yes, yes. to independence. <laughs> the, the thing is the Scots, however, are a very talented uh, people, and I believe that they could uh, make a very good go of it if they could get rid of this, um, this terrible dependence. Uh, so I think uh, they would probably benefit more prob than, than us. Right, I have more people on the list than we've got minutes left, so... Um. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Daniels. Uh, you told us that we are now all uh, pre-ills, so the logical next uh, step due to uh, bureaucrat uh, activity is that we will be all patients. So uh, imagine that you are a high-powered bureaucrat on the uh, WHO, do you have any suggestions to, to, to do the next transfer to patientness of all of us? You mean what will actually happen to, to make us... Uh, what, what will be necessary in your eyes as a high uh, official of the HW, uh, WHO to, to make us all patients instead of just pre-ills? Um. Well, one thing one could start doing is suggesting that people are penalized for not taking care of their own health. Um, uh, uh, and the, uh, and as you, uh, I don't know whether you know the book um, uh, by Samuel Butler, Erewhon, in which uh, crime is illness and illness is crime. And we ha are approaching that. So I think that's one possibility that we will actually be penalized we, to, uh, on the grounds that we are imposing costs on other people by not taking care of our health. And to an extent, that's already, that already happens. Um, but I don't... Uh, 
I don't think the WHO actually has a kind of conspiracy. It's just in the nature of those organizations to expand like fungus um, all over the world. Hi, for Sean. Uh, I loved your little piece there on the, uh, um, the influence that American intellectuals have had on the UK thought. The, I guess my major concern is that we still talk a lot about uh, socialism, but in America we don't talk about socialism, we talk about um, what you would call cultural Marxism, and I think we talk about it under the term postmodernism. Why is it that we don't have a movement of this nature, or why, haven't, why isn't the generational shift changed to be critical of that rather than an economic model that everybody's already abandoned? Um, sorry, I, I didn't quite catch the last bit of your question. Well, if, why are we talking about socialism when actually everybody's given up on the institutional model and, we've, and, and actually the problems become cultural? Uh, in other words, the, the fun, a normative discussion rather than an, uh, an institutional one. Okay, well, Paul Gottfried and I and many other people have um, written about this. It's just that um, having, we belong to various movements which have spent a century or more um, opposing socialism, and now that socialism in any meaningful sense has been um, destroyed, it is very difficult to recognize the new enemy as something different. I remember reading a, a book by Sir James Mackintosh published in 1790 in which he was discussing the French Jacobins and there was a repeated typing mistake uh, thanks to the typesetter which, um, which wrote Jacobins as Jacobites, uh, the Jacobites having been an earlier um, threat to, um, to, to, to Britain. Um, it said that we, that, that we you know, generals always fight the last war, and in the intellectual sense, we do. Um, it, it's quite fun to call Tony Blair a communist or um, President Obama a socialist radical, when quite manifestly these people are not socialists in any meaningful sense. And um, the left-wing socialists who denounce these people as non-socialists are not deluded. But it is very, bearing in mind that we won the war against socialism, it is very comforting to keep insisting that our present enemies are of exactly the same kind, whereas in fact we are facing an entirely different kind of enemy. Um, uh, totalitarian humanist is the phrase used by an American philosopher called Keith Preston. Um, my friend David Davis uses another phrase which Robert might be able to remind me of. Uh, th there are many names for these people, but we haven't agreed on a, single, uh, on a single name for them yet. But they're not socialists, they're something else. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to address this to Robert Neff. Um, I thought it was a very nice point that all the rest of the world, other than Switzerland, was a special case, uh, and that the paradigm was Switzerland. The uh, question is, is Switzerland changing, and is it becoming a special case in the, in the sense of the other countries of Western Europe? I think it was part of my lecture that uh, we shouldn't overrate these specialities and that, in fact, we do all the wrong things of our neighbors that just a little bit uh, slowlier. And, uh, but that's a unique selling position, to be slow uh, by going in the wrong direction. And, uh, of course, uh, our politics is more or less uh, social democrat. Uh, it's a mixture of everything. And when I am asked what, uh, what uh, would you change, I say less of all. Uh, and, but it's hard to find the way out of the trap. Uh, it's hard to find the, the way back. Uh, I tried to tell it in my last sentence. Uh, we should not go back to the ancient times of, of Switzerland, of Landsgemeine and so on, but we should reinvent what worked. And it was a lot what worked 
uh, it was the, the money system that worked, I didn't mention it, and, and a lot of those things. So Switzerland is uh, in this way, and I repeat it, it is not a model to copy, but it's an experiment that's uh, worth to learn from it. Okay, we can allow one more question. That's, that's the end then. Thank you. Um, it's interesting the juxtaposition between Switzerland and uh, the United Kingdom. And I know you've blamed all your faults on the colonialists and the Americans here. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the interesting juxtaposition is that it appears from uh, Dr. Daniels, your writing and, and, and your, your presentation this morning, that it's a, a problem from the top down. Uh, from the intelligentsia, from Gramsci coming over to uh, Columbia and, uh, and, 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 and making an impact and, and influencing uh, uh, from the top. And yet it appears from your presentation in Switzerland, there's this tremendous vitality in the local communities and from the bottom up. Is freedom, and I know this is somewhat an es uh, esoterical question, uh, maybe unable to answer, is freedom best preserved from the from the bottom up or the top down. We're looking for the top down solutions, but there seems to be a 500 year history in Switzerland that seems to sustain it from, from the bottom up. Yeah, I think that uh, there is uh, really a lot of uh, connections between uh, the British and the Swiss, and one of the most important business in Switzerland is tourism. And it has been invented by the, the British people liking the arts. But the Swiss didn't like it themselves. Uh, we didn't know that it is beautiful and that it is nice to climb. But uh, we had the, the people from, uh, from your country coming here, yes. and they liked it. And uh, in fact, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's good business. Uh, but of course, uh, in, the, in, the 18, in the 19th and 20th century, there was a very strong uh, connection between Germany and Switzerland. And this connection has been uh, destroyed in First World War that destroyed a lot of things. It was one of the big catastrophes of the civilization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, after this, uh, uh, we still have good connections. We, we have also kind of a island feeling in Switzerland. And uh, this makes maybe a, a, a good, uh, uh, and uh, English is kind of our uh, fifth uh, uh, official, not, not non-official language, because the French speaking don't like to learn German. And the German speaking, they try to learn French, but it's very difficult to speak a good French. And so it starts that young people start to communicate in English. And uh, I am sure that in maybe 20 years, it, it will be the normal language uh, in business and the normal language between the young people communicating with each other. So, uh, of course, English is not only uh, British, it's a world language, but it's, uh, it went on on spontaneous order. Nobody really said, you have to speak English here, uh, that the French uh, tried to do that, that maybe it was really uh, a mistake that they tried to put uh, language and politics together. The British never did it, and so it developed, and now it's, it's the, the global language. Thank you. Um, as far as uh, the Russians have, I believe they have a saying, a fish uh, rots from the head down. Uh, but uh, to which one can add, but it does rot. So that it, even if, if the rot in Britain has <coughs> spread down, there is that actual rot now, so a, if you like, it's a dialectical relationship, dare I say the word dialectical. And, um, and so now what is necessary is a change, I think, of mentality of the entire population. Um, and that's why I'm not really very optimistic. Um, but, but something can rot from the, the head down, from the top down, but the rot is real enough. Um, as far as freedom is concerned, it depends on circumstances. Um, in Switzerland, quite obviously, freedom is sustained from the bottom up. And it may be, though I'm speaking of a foreign country, which I know very little, 
uh, and one should be cautious of doing that. It may well be that in the United States there is a strong, a strong determination to protect freedom at the bottom. In England, uh, um, and, and I don't have much time for Nietzsche, but I am somewhat of an elitist, in England, freedom was most effectively guaranteed by a liberal aristocracy and gentry. Um, uh, of course, there were persons from the bottom who added to the canon of classical liberalism, but when you look at the classical liberals, when you look at vaguely libertarian politicians, they were nearly all drawn from the upper reaches of society, and it has been with the decline of the old landed order that freedom has um, seen its greatest decline in England. Uh, and so, um, at the moment, we are left, at least I am left, with the, um, with the only available option in England, which is to hope that there will be a reassertion of rights from the bottom up. But I suspect that freedom is most, sh most effectively guaranteed in the long term by um, a vaguely liberal um, upper class.